We're especially thankful that you are with us. Uh, for those who haven't been with us, uh, we are concluding today a study in the book of Job. Uh, actually, it's been a 12-week study. Uh, Ten weeks have been devoted to the actual review of the text. Uh, if you remember from our very first class, we introduced the book and overviewed some of the main themes. Uh, today is really a day focused on summarizing the book of Job with, of course, an understanding of the implications for us, most importantly, the spiritual implication for us in terms of what God had intended to communicate uh, through this book and what, of course, we learn about uh, Jehovah and his will for mankind. Before we get started in that uh, review, uh, Artie is going to lead us in a word of prayer. Let's please bow for this prayer. Dear Father in heaven, what an honor it is for us to be able to worship you, to be able to study your word. We pray that you will give us the understanding of your word. Pray that we've all come here today with open hearts and open minds, ready to, to learn your word, to put our preconceived notions out of the way, <clears throat> and understand it in all its truth and simplicity. We are so blessed in so many ways uh, that you just shower blessings upon us each and every day. One of the blessings that we are always thankful for is the freedoms of this country we live in to, to come together and worship you like this. We pray that we will always have those freedoms. We pray that you will help us to realize how what a blessing it is because many do not have these freedoms. Pray today as we finish up this study on on Job that we we understand the <clears throat> that the, sometimes there are suffering sometimes there are things that happen but if we are true to you if we look to you you will guide us through them and most of all we know if we're true true to you in the end we will be blessed beyond anything we can even imagine so help us keep that in our mind at all times. Be with Jack as he leads this class. Help us all to participate and get as much out of this class as possible. We're thankful for your son, the blessings we have through him. We ask this in his name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Artie. All right. When we introduced the book of Job, we recognized that in effect, even if we were to look at this as a piece of literature, uh, it would be regarded as one of the world's masterpieces of literature, uh, primarily consisting of poetry, except for the beginning and the end. Uh, it is one of those great accomplishments uh, of literature. But beyond that, uh, there are many truths that are revealed in the study of the book of, of Job. And as we get to a point in time where we're trying to summarize uh, what the book consists of. Of course, there are many different techniques that we could employ uh, to do that very thing. Uh, I've chosen the device of looking at the main characters uh, as a way of summarizing the book. And we will address all of the main characters, not necessarily entirely in the order in which they appear, but certainly uh, it will give us a chance to take a look uh, a more uh, expanded view of the overall book and its important themes that are brought out, especially in the interactions between uh, the main characters. So, with that in mind, uh, let's start actually with Satan. Satan is clearly a main character in the book of Job, although he appears only in the first two chapters, uh, but that sets the stage. So if we go back to chapters one and two, what was the challenge? What was the challenge that Satan presented to God? This sets the tone for the entire book. Carol. Um, this is something that I'm wondering about because Satan comes to God and says, Well, Up 
All right, so, so we definitely have obviously an interaction between God and, and Satan. Uh, God has indicated, consider Job, and we understand as the description of Job goes that he was a great man, he was a faithful worshiper, he was one who even offered sacrifices for his children in case they had sinned, uh, considered to be the greatest man of, of the East. So he was some worth, a man worthy of consideration. What was his challenge? What was Satan's challenge to God? Randy? I'll summarize it maybe differently than you have uh, already, but I'm sorry about that. But it seems like uh, the challenge is if, if the good things are taken away from Job, would he not be faithful to God? Would, is he just doing them because God has granted him such good graces? Or is he really a righteous judge? Exactly. Uh, so the challenge is that if you touch him, you take away his possessions, uh, he will renounce you, he will curse you. Uh, in fact, because this is such an essential point, let's go to Job chapter 1 and verse 9. Job chapter 1 and verse 9, uh, after God's description of Job, Satan answered the Lord, does Job fear God for nothing? Um, and then in verse 10, Hast thou not made a hedge about him and his home and all that he has on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands and his possessions have increased in the land. But per put forth thy hand now and touch all that he has. He will surely curse thee to thy face. So, as Randy indicated, it was that in effect you're paying Job to be faithful unto you and to humble yourself and to, and and for Job to humble himself before you. And then if we look at chapter 2 and, and verse 5, uh, after Job had not renounced God with the loss of his children and possessions, uh, Satan put forward another challenge. However, put forth thy hand now and touch his bone and flesh, he will curse thee to thy face. So, uh, Satan's challenge to Jehovah was that touch Job's possessions uh, and his flesh and bones and he will renounce you and he'll renounce you to your face. Um, and so, because of Satan, which is an important statement, what happened to Job? What's, what, what happened to Job because of Satan? Great suffering. Great suffering. So, he lost his flocks and his herds and his children, they were all taken from him. He was afflicted from head to toe. Uh, and what did he hear from his wife? All right, so he, his, his wife had lost faith, and she encouraged him to curse God uh, and then die. And what about his friends, the friends that would come to, to Job? What support did they provide? thinking of the right word. None. Uh, in fact, what, what did they accuse Job of? Sin. sin. They accused Job of being a great sinner. Now, how would that have made Job feel? I mean, in addition to all that he's lost and the tremendous pain from head to toe, he has so-called bosom friends come to him and tell him that this has all happened because you are a great sinner. Now, in addition to that, if that weren't enough, then what else is described about Job's reality in the society in which he operated? Anita? He lost all respect of others, and even the people he wouldn't have even hired were looking down on him. All right, exactly. He was... He, he, as Anita said, he lost the respect of all others, even those who would be considered the dregs of society, uh, who weren't worthy of being hired by Job to perform the most menial task because they weren't trustworthy people. Even those people ridiculed Job and, and looked down upon him. And so if we were to think about this, and the condition in which Job operated, 
He called to God. He called out to God in his pain and in his suffering and in his misery. And what happened? At first, no reply, no response. So, if you were to think then about creating a scenario where you would subject another person to the depth of misery, is there any other technique other than putting him to death that Satan could have deployed to create misery for Job? He tried everything that he could possibly do. And sometimes, this is sort of football season, we talk about defenses bending but not breaking. Job, Job bent, but he didn't actually break in terms of his faith uh, in God. Uh, but Satan wrought all of these things. Um, however, Job never renounced God as Satan confidently stated that he would, and even as Job's wife suggested that he should, but he, re he remained steadfast in proclaiming his, his innocence and his faith in Jehovah. Randy? What, what point can be made, maybe, um, in, we see uh, as this goes on, like the, the, the three friends accuse him, and then later on, it's, it's an emotional roller coaster for him. You know, he feels like, I'm, I'm righteous, I haven't done any wrong, but God, why have you done this? You know, just blatant questioning and accusations toward God that he hasn't been just toward him. What, what will he make? Uh, we'll get to that. Okay. All right. Very good. Uh, Randy's anticipating an important point that we're going to bring out. Uh, just, Phil. Just to, I thought it was interesting when I was just hearing the conversation that Satan's reaction was that, and it's, it breaks down a little bit, was the exact opposite of the friend, in that if you are a sinner, you're going to get punished, and if you're righteous, you aren't, and you're going to get all the blessings. You know, that there's a flip side to this, and you would wonder why if the, if the if the friends thought that he was a sinner and that's why he's being punished, when everything was going great with them, what did they think of all that? Well, and you know, that, you know, you know what I'm saying I mean, it, <laughs> right, and and actually, well, I want to take a look at the friends next, but their position was not supportable. Uh, the position they they held was not one that could. That, that, could be, that could be maintained, but you're speaking to a neologic, uh, and, and I would agree. Let's talk about the friends. The friends who came to visit Job, by appointment it would seem, an arrangement, basically what was their explanation? What was their position? And what did they communicate to Job to explain his suffering. That the innocent do not suffer. All right, that the innocent do not suffer. That all suffering, I mean, basically their position was that all suffering is a punishment for wrongdoing. All suffering is a punishment for wrongdoing. And actually, they maintained that position all the way throughout all of the discourses that took place. They never. They never varied in their point of view. And in fact, what did, what did they do in addition? In addition to maintaining that position, what did they say about Job? Anita? He needed to turn back to God, and they also negatively reported what he actually did. All right. They made unsubstantiated charges against Job. They made charges against Job that they could not provide proof for. So, and again, how would that make you feel when your best friends came and not only said that you're suffering as a result of your own sin, but I'm charging you with the most unpleasant and unwholesome crimes, but I can't actually provide proof for that. So, um, Job correctly refers to them as 
miserable comforters. Now, in response to that, what did Job say? In response to those arguments, what did Job say? He continued to maintain what? His own innocence. And in fact, he was basically saying that your conclusions are wrong. Uh, his position was what? In, in, in regard to the arguments they were making, what was his position? If they said that all suffering is a result of wrongdoing, Job's position in, in, uh, in contrary form to that was what, Anita? He even pointed out that you know, there were those who suffered who had done no wrong. All right, exactly. That suffering is not punishment for wrongdoing in the way that, that uh, the friends were espousing, and prosperity is not a reward for righteousness because there are too many contrary examples to that point of view. We can look around in life and see all kinds of examples of the wicked prospering and the righteous suffering. And so that point of view can't possibly be correct. Now, wickedness and righteousness may have consequences for one's life, but to hang your entire argument on the proposition that all suffering is a result of sin is a false proposition. Bruce? Well, they not only accused him of being sinful, but they said your sons, your children died because they evidently were sinful too. So he's even, he's even, you know, putting flame to the fire. Yeah. So, uh, so as Bruce is pointing out, in addition, that would imply that, that uh, his children were likewise sinners of a great magnitude who were put to death by something God chose to do. All right, so we, we certainly do understand, and we see it today. These are experiences that don't change over time, that the wicked may prosper, uh, the righteous may suffer, but the point of, that Job was making was that neither of these outcomes are based on the proposition that was brought forward by the friends. Now. Where did the friends get their arguments? Where, where did they, what was the origin of their wisdom? Scott? Dreams, their personal history, their ages, themselves basically. Okay. All right, thank you. So by the record, the origin of their point of view, of their proposition that they were so adamant in presenting was basically their own experience. That is, as a result of human experience and as a result of the traditions of mankind. They relied upon traditions and they relied upon their own experience to draw the conclusion that all suffering is a punishment for sin. So what does the story reveal about that? That when it comes to matters of God, relying upon the traditions of men and one's own human experience can take you to what? Very erroneous conclusions. All right? Carol. It's kind of back to the black and white of trying to earn your way and, and having no grace themselves in others. And they also repeatedly presume God is striking Job rather than Satan striking Job. And they, as Carol pointed out, they were taking a very black and white point of view, and they maintained this point of view all the way through. They never retracted it. They never retracted it. Job silenced them such that they could not answer him, and so they were without any further comment, but they never retracted what they said. Randy? And, and along with black and white, it's very simplistic. That, that you want to put God in a box and say, God is a just God. Okay, now these things have to be true. He has to act in this certain way for him to be just because that's my view of justice. Yeah. And, and, and not looking to what God would show them or tell them. And, and we can do that as well. Take a simplistic view, take our own knowledge, and, and determine 
who God is, but not continually looking over our minds to what does God really say to us. And in fact, I think that's one of the most important implications that we can draw from the from the study of the book, which we'll get to as we as we build our summary out. All right. Uh, very good. Good input, uh, Randy. Uh, Job. Let's turn to Job. Um, Job, of course, as we know, and as we've already implied, defended his innocence all the way throughout um, until, of course, after Jehovah spoke. But he defended his, in, uh, his innocence. He maintained that uh, point of view. And in fact, as was already said, he silenced to the point where he silenced his friends uh, after the three cycles of speeches. So, since Job maintained his innocence in, re in relation to the charges being brought by the friends, what did he conclude about what had happened to him? Anita? He decided God must be behind it. All right. He concluded that all of the calamities that he was experiencing, all the pain that he was experiencing, all the suffering uh, that he was experiencing came from Jehovah. But he did not know why. But he, made the, he, he reached the conclusion that uh, this was a result of Jehovah's doing. And he cried out to God for an explanation, but he got no answer from God. He got no direct answer from God until the end. So, given this experience and the failure to get an answer and all of the other disappointments that he was experiencing in relation to his family, his friends, society at large, his tremendous physical suffering, Job did not lose his faith in God, so he concluded what? He concluded that this would all be resolved or vindicated sometime in the unknown future. I mean, that was a statement that he had made. But in addition to that, as we, I think the word roller coaster was used, we saw Job go through a roller coaster of emotions and he made charges against God. What are some of the things that he charged God of? Well, if we go to chapter 9 of Job and look at verses 22 through 24. In fact, let's have someone read that passage. Chapter 9 Verses 22 through 24. Who has that passage of scripture? <coughs> Rick, do you have that? Yeah. 23 to 24. Correct. It is all one, therefore I say, he destroys the guiltless and the wicked. If the scourge kills suddenly, he mocks the despair of the innocent. The earth is given into the hand of the wicked. He covers the face of his judges. If it is not he, then who is it? All right, so what, what is this charge? That, that God has no, mo no, no role in moral government, that he just allows whatever to happen to happen. That there's no agency of God uh, in the outcome of these things. Uh, and, and really, it's a terrible statement to make about God. It's a terrible indictment to make about God that he uh, is exercising no moral government uh, among men. But in addition to that, he concluded what about God? That God was his enemy. He concluded God uh, 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 being his adversary. In, in chapter 16 and verse, verse 9, uh, this is what, what Job said. His anger has torn me and hunted me down. He has gnashed, me, gnashed at me with his teeth. My adversary glares at me. And in addition to that, so he's not only, not only does, he, does he not operate in the moral governance of the universe, uh, he is my adversary and my enemy, and 
In addition, he is, how is he treating me? Is he treating me fairly or unfairly? Is he treating me justly or unjustly? Uh, he accuses God of injustice toward Job. In chapter 30 and verse 21, Thou hast become cruel to me. With the might of thy hand thou dost persecute me. Now, these charges are untrue. They're a terrible indictment against God. And in what way was Job operating or behaving exactly the same way as the friends? He was speaking without knowledge. In the same way that the friends spoke without knowledge, Job is now, in these uh, passages, a speaking without knowledge. Now, considering Job's mental emotional, physical condition. Uh, I, I think it's human nature that we're tempted to excuse him. I mean, we don't have record of anyone suffering in the way that Job had suffered. But can the charges that Job made against God go unrebuked? Can they, they go uncorrected? Jack, that we, we're given some leniency as humans uh, trying to serve an all-powerful and knowing God that, that he understands we don't know the answers. And sometimes we ask really stupid questions and, and we act out in emotional ways that we shouldn't. But he's graceful to stand by until usually that time that we are supple and humble enough to hear him. Then he or, or Which again is basically the concluding conversation of the book. When Abraham was speaking to the messengers of God prior to the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, he made a statement to the effect of God can do only that which is just. And as a result of that, and we want to hear what Randy has to say because God redeems Job in his humility that was brought about by God's intervention. But these charges... It's important to acknowledge at the same time that these charges could not go unrebuked or uncorrected. Bruce? When, I mean, all throughout the book, Job has said, you know, I want to obey God, I want God to hear. Well, God's heard everything he said. But here, then, the end, when God says, okay, Job, and then he talks about, you know, his powers and magnificence, then Job realizes I was wrong. Exactly. All right, Scott? Yeah, so love and justice are not incompatible. God says very clearly in his word that he disciplines those he loves. He obviously loves Job. He put Job in it you know, in a moment. Uh, but he had to execute his justice. He had to set things straight, not just for Job, but for us. I mean, and there was so much from this, this book about suffering and, and where wisdom comes from and the place of God, the sovereignty of God, and the love of God. God hadn't acted like he did with Job and corrected him. He wouldn't have been able to learn with specificity about this. Very well stated. Jackson? Well, when God does speak, the, the first thing he says is, who is this who darkens counsel and speaks word without knowledge? And God humbles Job, and then Job has an opportunity to respond, and then he says, I'm not going to respond, and he covers his mouth. So Job is rebuked, and Job also is required to offer sacrifices for sin, and then God tells him that he needs to offer sacrifices for his friends because they have sinned even greater in their ignorance and their arrogance and how they categorize what, what has happened. So 
get, Job does get rebuked in this situation, but the friends suffer. The, the friends also suffer much more harsh rebuke because they have they've really gone off the deep end when they didn't have a reason to. And I think God does show some mercy to Job in his response. All right. Very good. Very good input, and we'll kind of reinforce those points in the time we have left. But, but let's consider this question for a moment. What really was the battle that was going on in the heart of Job? <coughs> what was the battle that was going on in the heart of Job? Jackson? He wanted to know why, and he wanted a mediator. In, in chapter 9, he asked for a mediator, and so he doesn't have the benefit of the new covenant like we do. We have a mediator in Jesus Christ. We have, we have the inspired words, so we can know we have a better and more accurate knowledge of why things happen than, than Job did. So we understand we can have the ability to understand God's will, and we know that what Jesus accomplished on our behalf, but Job didn't know those things. He didn't, he didn't have a mediator like Jesus Christ, and so he wanted to he wanted to debate God. He wanted to have his questions answered, but he didn't he didn't have the authority or the ability to do any of those things. All right, Job was battling, it was a battle of faith in the, con in the context of all of the suffering and calamities and distress he, he was experiencing. And I think as the points have been made, it's a battle that could only have been won with the direct involvement of God, his grace and his intervention in, in the life of Job. Uh, the solution for Job did demand a redeemer, and that redeemer could only be found in God and in, and in the redemption that he could provide. All right, we hasten on. Elihu. Who does Elihu seem to be? Or how would you characterize the role of Elihu? Not among the three friends, but the one who spoke at the end. Bruce? Well, he took down the younger. He's just been listening. He's not been offering any, anything. And, and points, out, points out the fallacies of both parties here. Very good. So he appears to be, he appears to be a messenger of God uh, in, that, in that sense. And what was his main purpose? I think as Bruce already alluded to, to point out Job's sins committed during the debate between Job and the three friends. Now, interestingly enough, in the discussion, in what Elijah had to offer and the arguments he presented, Job actually never responded. Uh, he didn't agree, he didn't disagree, he certainly didn't retract any of the statements that he had made. But Elihu's purpose seemed to be very clear. He diligently wanted to make Job see his mistakes, the mistakes he made in the claims that, that he had put forward and his, his main argument or his main technique to get Job to see his mistakes was what? He, he concentrated on what? On the greatness of God, on the smallness of Job, and what was the end of the wicked. That was basically what Elihu uh, presented. And in many respects, all of this was done in preparation for Jehovah speaking. Bruce? And you mentioned, you know, Job's accusation that God needed or refused. Well, Elihu's the one that's doing that. He's the one that's really calling him out on all of this. Very good. Uh, also, also, just, uh, I think Jackson mentioned, you know, he's one that intercessor, he's one that mediator between him and God. Elihu is a similar, is similar to somebody who's going to help you in, in that you see God better, or you get in a better relationship with God. I would see him as an All right, so he, he, was, he was instructive in that way, uh, attempting to mold and to change and to redirect Job's conclusions. And again, I think in a setup to introducing Jehovah. So Jehovah appears in a whirlwind, and he asks Job a series of questions. And, and basically, initially, what did what did 
Jehovah bring into consideration for Job? He described the inanimate and the animate world and its creation was brought before Job. It, it was described to illustrate what? Or to bring about what conclusion? Which Job acknowledged. Wayne? The difference between God and man. Exactly. Uh, the great uh, difference between God and man. God's greatness and man's smallness. Um, and what was his purpose? What was his purpose in doing that? Phil? I think Elijah might have said in Matthew chapter 33, verse 13, why do you complain against him that he does not give an account of all his things? It's like, who are you to go ahead and even draw me into account? I can do whatever I want. You didn't make the animals. I did. I did it my way. You know, I did exactly what I wanted to do, and I'm still doing that. You know? Building on what Phil has said, um, <laughs> Jehovah's purpose seems to be to uh, get Job to realize that he was he was arrogant in speaking to God and in, in the way in which he did, and and really brazen in his demand that God answer him. Now, another point that stands out in this wonderful discussion provided by Jehovah was what we talked about this at some length last week. In the creation was expressed what? What was expressed in the creation? the power and the wisdom and the knowledge of God is expressed in the inanimate and animate world which God created as he explained to Job. And what else? That in every aspect of God's creation there was what? Purpose. purpose. There was a purpose in the design of the creation for all elements that God created. And so, first of all, we're taken aback just to even consider the magnitude of what's required to do that. So, now let's, let's bring this then to a critical point that deals with the main challenge to Job's faith, and that is what? What's the implication? Given given that in all of the creation there is an, an illustration, a demonstration of God's infinite wisdom, unmeasurable by us, in the infinite wisdom displayed in God's creation, then by that wisdom, what can God do? He can, he can use the difficulties and the suffering of life that comes upon mankind to train and to discipline and to instruct. And given that, it, it, the, the purpose is to refine man. If, if man will yet but seek God. So, um, it's difficult for us. Uh, we, we may wonder, because it's beyond our comprehension to understand how God has accomplished all of this, how he has designed the universe in the way in which he did, um, and how he manages the affairs of the universe. But it's really not ours to understand, and it's certainly not ours to question. Our responsibility is what in relation to that? Faithfulness, Faithfulness to God, to, humil to humble ourselves before God. We don't have the, the wisdom and the knowledge and the understanding to, to really appreciate how God controls the universe. Uh, it's beyond our power to understand these things. So, but in light of that, and in our consideration of that, which the book of Job emphasizes as critical, what's the implication for us? Bruce? 
one thing I think of too, not having knowledge, not knowing how all this works, is trust, I mean, faithfulness, but also just trust like a child would trust a parent. Exactly. A, a, a trust and a faith in God. Um, the observation made with regard to the healings of Jesus when he, in his ministry, the miracles that he worked, the healings that he performed. In, in the book of Mark chapter 7, it says that they concluded that he does all things well. That should be our response. A conclusion that God does all things well. And we must bow before such a one in, in, in worship and adoration in effect saying that he has done all things well. All right, um, so the book of Job. So step back, take the big picture view. What has God given us in the book of Job? Certainly an insight into his workings. All right. Certainly an insight into the workings of God and the power and the majesty and the knowledge and the wisdom and the design that's revealed in his creation. All right? With regard to Job and his experience, what has God given us? What, what is one of the major themes addressed in the book? It, one of the, if not the major challenge to resolve in the book is what? How can we reconcile two things? What are the two things? What was Job's experience? It was good. How can we reconcile the suffering of mankind with what? The goodness of God. And so God gives us a panoramic view in the book of Job of that. Now, what, what does the, let's go back to the beginning of the book. What does the happy initial state of Job, as described in chapter 1, what does that remind us of elsewhere in the book? It, uh, not in the book, but in the Bible, in God's Word. The Garden, the Garden of Eden. <clears throat> That was the happy initial state of Job, similar to the happy initial state of mankind before what? Before Satan arrived on the scene, and in the wake of his involvement, we see all of this havoc. Destruction, disease, enmity, and lies, and lies and falsehoods. Uh, basically, in the book of Job is graphically epitomized what Satan has wrought. Now, if we're going to compare, though, Adam and, and Job, what's the difference? Adam yielded. Adam sinned. Job didn't yield. He bent, but he didn't break. He needed God's involvement. It's through the grace of God and the intervention of God that he was provided uh, these answers. And so for us, what, what, what does this mean for the servant of God today? We see ourselves as one unit in this great complex universe that God has created. But we are one unit, and we do exist. And what about God? He is aware of us, concerned about us, and wants the best possible outcome for us to spend eternity in his presence. Bruce? And Satan still has an influence. And Satan still has an influence today, of course, which we must be aware of at all times. Now, and sometimes we have friends like Job has. And sometimes we have friends like Job has. In fact, um, well, we could make, a, we could make a, a comparison to Christ, but I want to get to the end of the book. What do we see in the final scene? In the final scene, we see 
restoration. We see a triumphant and victorious Job who prevailed through his faith and the intervention of God. We see him identified as a mediator and a priest in relation to his friends. God appointed him to offer sacrifices on their behalf. What do we see in the household of Job? I think we should notice that that is graces reawarded to, to Job and not reward given to Job. All right. God's grace is re- God benefited, God benefited, benefited Job. Uh, and in fact, we could say Job was doubly benefited because not only were the, re- the possessions double in a sense, but he had an insight into God and God's working that never could have been attained had he not maintained through these sufferings and seeking these answers. Wayne? Also, there is a a type and a shadow of uh, the kingdom to come in the church in the fact that uh, the daughters, they're they're described as beautiful, which is seen as Christ's church. And, all, and then they are given inheritance just like the Gentiles were with the Jews. Uh, and the, and the, uh, yeah, the, the coming together of mankind <coughs> under Christ, there's just a shadow or a type of that right at that point. All right, very good. So we'll conclude with this, uh, as Wayne pointed out. But in that final scene, that, that scene of triumph and victory, Job is now surrounded by those who had rejected him. Those, I mean, what did he say? We we know what he said about his own family, that they basically had abandoned him. Now they came back, and it was a joyous feast. And in the same way, there will be a feast and a reconciliation for those who once rejected Christ, but were redeemed and enjoy that same reconciliation in the presence of of Jesus Christ in in heaven, the pathway that he's created for us through our own faith. There's more that could be said, but we've gotten through uh, the summary of the book of Job. Um, Final reconciliation. Any final comments? Phil? James 5.11. You have heard of the endurance of Job with steadfastness and have seen the outcome of the Lord's dealings that the Lord is full of compassion. All right, very good. Lord is full of compassion. Bruce? <coughs> the garden scene with Adam, and it seemed like Job has been restored to his garden. Job has been restored to his garden. Very good. Stan, did you have a comment? Yeah. Um, <coughs> the answer is question is answered, do you worship God or not? Do you worship God for not? Exactly. Um, And Job and God withstood the challenge of Satan. All right. Next week, we're going to have a one-week study on a special topic that Scott will present. And I believe the lesson sheets are in the hallway. So next week, a one-week study as we get ready then for the beginning of our new quarter, uh, Lord willing, uh, in January. Uh, Thank you.